could this 4-core AMD CPU from 2013 be the perfect CPU for your next budget gaming PC? Well, unfortunately this time it's not going to be quite as simple as checking out some quick and easy benchmarks. So before spending your hard earned cash, make sure to watch this video all the way through. Believe it or not, APUs haven't actually been around forever. In fact, the first APUs were released by AMD in just 2011, just two years before the A10 6800K was released as part of the Richland CPU lineup. The A10 6800K is a 4.1 GHz, 32 nm, 4 core, 4 thread. Wait, hang on, hang on. Did I say 4 core? Task Manager says we only have 2 cores, and CPU Z says we have 4. What on earth is going on here? Is this a dual core or a quad core? Well, to answer that, we need to look at exactly how a multi-core CPU works. The die of the CPU itself is split into multiple sections, which each perform different tasks. Let's take a look at the block diagram for pile driver CPUs like the A10 6800K. All CPUs ever work by first fetching an instruction, decoding it, and finally executing it. It's a very simplified view, but that's the overall process. The A10 6800K is no exception. First, fetching an instruction, and then decoding it here, in the instruction decoder. I know, it's a very clever name. It then executes this instruction in a CPU core, aka this instra cluster here. Often, these instructions will require maths, such as addition or multiplication, and this is done here, in the FPU, or otherwise known as floating point unit. But what exactly happens if integer cluster 1 and integer cluster 2 both try to execute an instruction in the FPU at the same time? Well, the FPU can only handle one instruction at a time, since it has a single dedicated scheduler, and that means that the core will have to wait, meaning wasted time and wasted clock cycles, and therefore means that these cores are non-independent unlike in Intel CPUs of the day, which had a dedicated FPU per core, making them completely non-reliant and completely independent. So what does all of this actually mean for you then? Well, it means that pile driver and bulldozer CPUs and APUs like the A10 6800 do indeed have four true cores, as advertised in CPU-Z and by AMD. But as a result of shared hardware resources, they cannot act completely independently, which actually finally resulted in a class action lawsuit against AMD for false advertising. A lawsuit that AMD went on to lose in 2017. And this is the reason why old AMD CPUs are so well known for their terrible performance in comparison to their Intel alternatives. But it's really important to note here that AMD actually managed to correct this issue with AMD Ryzen and it's no longer a thing that gamers need to worry about. Okay, but that still doesn't answer the question. Why is there this difference between Task Manager and CPU Z? Well, Task Manager is reporting the entire module, which contains both of the two physical cores as a single physical core. And it's doing this because of the single FPU, which functionally limits the dual core CPUs to a single CPU core. Task Manager then reports the number of integer clusters as logical processes, otherwise known as threads. CPU Z on the other hand is essentially just following what AMD say and agreeing that these half cores actually count as a full core. The thing is though, all of this controversy doesn't actually mean that this CPU is inherently bad. So let's take a look at it. I've got this CPU sat on my test bench, paired with 16GB of DDR3 RAM. Interestingly though, the A10 6800K was one of the first CPUs in the consumer line to support 2133MHz DDR3 RAM, which actually, according to AMD, could potentially provide performance increases of up to 10% in comparison to 1600MHz RAM. But since I don't have any 2133MHz RAM, we'll be using 16GB of 1600MHz RAM instead. And just like Ryzen processors, the Richland CPU family benefits significantly from these much higher RAM speeds, so potentially we'll be looking at doing some overclocking in the future as well. So then, getting this thing installed on my test bench, what's the CPU actually like to use? Well, paired with an SSD and a decent amount of RAM, you'll actually find the system is more than responsive, it's very snappy. In just for general office tasks, I can comfortably browse the web and stream 1080p video without any issues. But if you're watching this video, it's probably because you want to do more than just office-based tasks. So let's take a look at some real hardcore benchmarks. Going back to CPU-Z, CPU-Z actually has a built-in CPU benchmark in which the A10 6800K scored 242.8 single thread and 811.7 in multi-thread. 
We've then scored 335 in the world's most excruciatingly painful version of Cinebench R23. It took a whopping 25 minutes to complete. So going onwards, we're going to be using a slightly older version of Cinebench, which doesn't take anywhere near as long to complete. But after all that, what's it like for gaming? After all, this is an APU. The whole point of it is that it's good for graphics-based tasks like gaming. While well, loading up Rocket League at the lowest possible 720p settings, we were only just able to push 30 frames per second. Not exactly what I'd call impressive, and certainly far from a good gaming performance. 3D Mark Skydiver suggested that we were below average results for the A106800 k implying that other users had already overclocked. And I don't blame them, this is nearly unplayable. So this means there's only really one thing for it. Let's overclock and retest. So I jumped on a call with my mate Matt from Tech Tested. He's a great overclocker and streams his overclocking adventures on Twitch. So go give him a follow because he was a huge help in getting this APU overclocked to its absolute maximum. In the end, we reached a base clock of 104 megahertz and a RAM OC from 1600 megahertz all the way up to 2133. That was an absolutely huge boost and my goodness did it show. In fact, we even beat a Cinebench world record! Yay! This is the fastest CPU I've ever seen in my life. Scoring a whopping 400,000 points! Okay, okay, sure, it might have glitched out on me, but I'm still taking this as a victory regardless. Guinness World Records, here I come! But regardless of the broken Cinebench runs, we actually saw an absolutely ridiculous boost to our Rocket League performance. In fact, it was such an insane boost that I actually had to go back and recheck my original benchmarks because I didn't believe the boost would be so significant. We went from the lowest possible settings at 720p at 30 frames per second to almost 70 frames per second with the exact same settings. That's an absolutely mental increase. So I thought, why not try some other games? And you know, we actually had what I would consider the bare minimum of playable. So sure, it might not be the best gameplay experience, but not everyone can afford to spend hundreds on a gaming PC. A strict budget of £100 might realistically limit you to a system like this, so it's good to know that even if you can't play on anything other than these settings, you can at least have a playing experience, even if it isn't a fantastic one. And some games really stood out here. Trials Fusion, for instance, actually ran completely fine. Sure, it's not demanding, but I could easily play like this without issue. In fact, I completely forgot I was benchmarking whilst playing this game. That's quite possibly the best way to tell that a CPU or GPU is actually playing completely fine and you're going to have a really nice experience with it. I forgot I was benchmarking it. That tells you more than any numbers ever could. In fact, if you're planning on playing simple games like that, and especially if they're on the older side, you know, example off the top of my head, Age of Empires, you don't even need a graphics card. This will play it just fine. But what if you can actually afford a graphics card? There are plenty of you guys watching this video out there right now that are shopping for a budget gaming PC. So you're looking at this CPU and thinking, ooh, maybe I'll pair that with a graphics card. Well, for you guys, I wanted to answer whether or not you should buy this APU and pair it with a graphics card, or whether you should buy a comparable Intel CPU like the i3-3220 and pair that with a GPU. After all, the i3-3220 is cheaper despite its similar compute performance. So which should you buy? Well, a side-by-side -side comparison is actually quite revealing. You might think that the Intel CPU, since it's cheaper and lacks a powerful graphics core, would perform much worse. But in fact, performance is very similar, and both CPUs were able to take the performance crown in different titles. So why would you buy the Intel CPU? Well, for starters, a cheaper solution with more readily available hardware. That's kind of a big deal at the moment. Not to mention a clearer and easier upgrade path. Okay, okay, so those are some pretty convincing arguments, right? So then why would you buy the a 10 6800K? Well, that's not quite so easy of an argument to make. The upgrade path is near non-existent for this poor CPU, and the availability of performance hardware to improve overclocks is hard to come by, and therefore relatively expensive. But there are still reasons to buy this APU. If you're not going to be investing in the GPU, the a 10 6800K will beat out the equivalent Intel CPU's integrated graphics any single day of the week. The A10-6800K is also fully overclockable and supports higher frequency memory, which A is really fun to overclock and progress with, and B means that if you're stuck with the CPU as an option, you've got a lot of headroom to squeeze as much performance as possible out of it. So all in all, do I recommend buying the A10-6800K? To be honest, no. For 9 out of 10 people, an equivalent priced Intel CPU would be a far better option when you consider the overinflated price of the A10 6800K means that you could potentially buy an i7 2600, which is a far better CPU for the exact same price. 
Even though it doesn't have overclocking support, which was a blast to play around with on this CPU, you'd still have a better out of the box experience. But with that being said, this CPU was an absolute blast to play around with. It's surprisingly capable, especially when overclocked, but unless your use case is really specific or you intend on gaming without a graphics card, I can't really see much of a reason to buy this CPU. But if you guys did enjoy this video, I would really appreciate if you hit like and got subscribed. It's a bit more of an interesting one. I can't, I don't remember if I've ever actually covered an APU before. So this could well be my first APU review video. So if you did enjoy it, then be sure to let me know in the comment section down below. And for the next time I review an APU, be sure to leave some constructive criticism as well, because I'm always looking to improve my videos. So if there's something that I didn't cover in this video that you guys think I should have, then I'd be really happy if you could let me know kindly, let me know kindly in the comments down below. I'd really appreciate it that feedback guys okay well without any further titting about i'm gonna get off and uh, get back to work because i've just filmed this on my lunch break and uh, in theory this video should go live tomorrow yeah i'm cutting it tight again sorry